ancient stone buildings festooned with satellite dishes and drying laundry leaned precariously inward, as if they might collapse at any moment. Alawi leaned back in his seat and ran his forearm across his brow. He was hot and uncomfortable, his open shirt already damp with sweat. The van's air conditioner hadn't worked in years, and rolling down the windows meant allowing in the relentless wind-blown sand, the fumes of other cars struggling to run on cheap gasoline, the reek of animal shit, and countless other unsavory odors. He was a builder and electrician by trade, a source of great pride for both him and his family most of his adult life, a skilled job, a trade to be proud of. Now there was even greater demand for his services, both in Mosul and many of the surrounding towns. Everything that had been bombed and destroyed in the chaos of the invasion had to be painstakingly rebuilt. A man like him could make a fortune in just a few years, enough to provide for his wife and for his two young sons until they became men and followed in his footsteps. Enough to live in comfort, enough to escape the grinding poverty that his peers endured. If only he could get where he needed to be. He honked his horn again, and, at last, a gap began to open up. The beaten-up white saloon started to trundle forwards, exhaust rattling. He stepped on the accelerator as well, eager to keep their momentum going. Relieved to be on the move again, he reached for the packet of cigarettes lying on the passenger seat, tapped one out, and held it to his lips as he fished his lighter out of his pocket. Maybe today wouldn't be so bad after all, he thought, as he clicked the lighter. The sudden flash of light up ahead was so unexpected that he didn't even have time to react to it. The cigarette fell from his mouth as the white car in front disappeared, consumed along with everything else by an expanding wall of orange flame that rushed forward to meet him. Central Intelligence Agency Field Ops Center, Baghdad, Iraq This had better be good, Operations Chief Stephen Kaminsky grumbled as he strode from his office, doing his best to ignore the painful twinge in the small of his back. A compressed disc from a high school football injury. The pain came and went, though in recent years it seemed to be coming more frequently and with greater intensity. All things considered, today was a bad day, and judging by the urgent summons that had just come through to his desk, it wasn't likely to get any better. With computer terminals crammed into virtually every available one of its 5,000 square feet of floor space, the pit, as it was known, was reminiscent of NASA's Mission Control Center. The comparison was an appropriate one, because, in many ways, it served a similar function. The computers in this room allowed their operators to control a fleet of 20 unmanned predator drones deployed throughout the country. The place was bustling with activity, and judging by the concerned looks and urgent tones, the news was not good. Somebody talk to me. He was joined within moments by Pete Faulkner, the floor officer, and the man responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the twenty control suites in the pit. Faulkner was only in his forties, but with his overhanging beer gut, perpetually furrowed brow and thinning grey hair, he looked at least ten years older. He was always tired, always out of breath, always sweating. We've got a problem, he said, wasting no time on preliminaries. Kaminsky made a face. So I heard. What's going on? Faulkner gestured over to Terminal 6, where most of the anxious-looking technicians were gathered. The flat-screen monitors that should have been transmitting feeds from the Predator's onboard cameras and instrumentation were blank, as though there was nothing going on. Three minutes ago, we lost contact with one of our drones over Mosul, he explained as they strode over. Data feeds, telemetry, the works. Kaminsky frowned. Has it been shot down? Faulkner shook his head. It was orbiting at 10,000 feet. The only thing that could shoot it down from that altitude is a surface-to-air missile, and we had no threat warnings before we lost contact. Equipment failure? It's possible, Faulkner admitted, but unlikely. Unless it was a catastrophic engine failure, we'd have seen some sign before we lost the feeds. Make a hole here, gentlemen. The junior technicians clustered round the terminal, parted like the Red Sea giving them a clear path to a young man working over one of the few remaining monitors still up and running. Terminal 6 and its associated drone were his responsibility. He knew he had done nothing wrong.